Uh, wanting to get started uh, with announcing uh, the winners of the SMCI Best Manuscripts in Improvement. Um, so recently, we went through the process. You might have remembered me in uh, the fall begging you to submit some manuscripts to a link um, and putting it in the chat all the time. Um, and after that process, we have a group of judges who come together and judge the manuscripts and uh, the top, uh, well, the abstracts, then the top publications on um, how it relates to Stanford priorities, how it would relate to global or national priorities, and then presentations of the methods and results, and as well as the conclusion and discussion. Um, if you have any questions on how we judge, uh, please uh, contact me and ask, and I would love to have you as a judge for next year's Manuscript Award. Um, but without further ado, here are the winners of this year's Manuscript Award. So we have four awards, the adult population of manuscript, or the best adult uh, pop focused manuscript was a quality framework to address racial and ethnic disparities in emergency uh, department care. Um, and Michelle Lynn, our very own uh, Stanford chair, was the author who submitted this publication. Um, but I highly recommend uh, reading this paper, particularly. I think it can apply to so many areas of healthcare um, and provides a great framework to thinking about how quality metrics could uh, be adjusted to account for equity. For a pediatric population, uh, the winner was Emily Lavoie with and co-authors with a multifaceted intervention to improve teamwork in on an inpatient uh, pediatric uh, neurosurgery service. And here's a picture of the team. Um, and this was a great, a fabulous paper. This was uh, our highest scoring paper overall, actually, um, and presented a very practical intervention uh, with a great presentations of the results. So also highly recommend that one. Um, our third award is a publication that focuses on healthcare workers, and this is improving operating room efficiency through reducing first start delays in an academic center. Center and was really a uh, great example of how to report quality improvement work uh, within the literature. So congratulations to uh, Dylan and his team um, on this great publication. And then finally, we have our, for the second year ever, the first authored by a trainee, the best paper in this category goes to David um, and his team, which is data-driven longitudinal characterization of neonatal health and morbidity. And this is a huge team. There was two slides of authors. Luckily, they all fit. Um, and I love this paper in the fact that it is very much AI statistical driven, but so well written that it was easy to follow. Um, and I learned so much along the way, but great presentation of a complex um, problem on how to identify uh, neonatal infants early for risks and um, has great implications for how this model could be used to improve care later on. Um, but congratulations to all the award winners. We will be featuring them at uh, this presentation or at the seminar series in the future, um, as well as inviting them to a, a celebratory lunch. Um, and with that, I will pass it off to one of our wonderful judges, Stacy, and Sabrina, actually both judges, so Stacy and Sabrina. Hi, thank you. Well, it is my pleasure to be here with you all today and to help present our guest speaker for today's series lecture. So I have the privilege of uh, presenting Dr. Stacy Serber. She is currently the manager of advanced practice providers within professional practice and clinical improvement department. 
Dr. Sherbert joined Stanford as a clinical nurse specialist in 2016, starting on the medicine units, and transitioned to the neurosurgery, neurology, stroke, epilepsy service lines in 2019. Her work here has included multidisciplinary right pro projects, reducing inpatient mortality on the general medicine service line, leading to hard to swallow a multidisciplinary approach to increase dysphagia compliance and stroke patients and chairing the patient care services policy and procedure committee. Dr. Serber has presented regionally, nationally, and internationally on a variety of topics and has published her research and project results. She received her PhD in nursing from UCLA in 2007. Her doctoral dissertation focused on cerebral blood flow velocity, gray matter injury, cognition, and vasomotor reactivity in heart failure patients. She received her master's degree in UCLA in 1994 as a cr uh, critical care clinical nurse specialist. Her numerous association memberships include Sigma Theta Ta Honor Society, American Association of Neuroscience Nurses, American Association of Critical Care Nurses, the Nas National Association of Clinical Care uh, Clinical Nurse Specialists, an Association of California Nurse Leaders, as well as Society for Neuroscience. Dr. Serber has held many positions throughout her 35 years in nursing, including assistant professor, lecturer, research coordinator, and clinical educator, along with 16 years of burn, surgical, and neurotrauma ICU clinical practice. So without further ado, Dr. Cece Serber. Well, good afternoon, and thank you all for coming. Thank you for the invite. It is an honor to present to this esteemed group. So thank you very much. Um, this is the project that Sabrina referenced about increasing dysphagia compliance. This is a project that we started a couple years back and we've had um, the honor of presenting at five different uh, podium presentations. This is number six that was generated by this project and I'm working on the minor edits for the journal submission to Journal of Neuroscience Nurses. Um, we've been accepted pending minor revisions, so I'm doing those minor revisions. Um, so yeah, clearly this project um, generated a lot of interest. The focus for this particular topic today is the focus on the team aspects and how we integrated a multidisciplinary aspect into this project. So. With that, I will begin to screen share my slides. All right. So disclosures, I have nothing to disclose, no financial support, no commercial support or sponsorships. Okay, so the objectives here, again, with the multidisciplinary aspect, um, pinpointing the multidisciplinary barriers to success and identifying opportunities to reduce fallouts and strategies to increase multidisciplinary partnership in and compliance with stroke programs. So a little bit of introduction. Um, Stanford had an impending comprehensive stroke center survey and lower than desired dysphagia compliance. We are the first comprehensive stroke center in the country. So there's a lot of pressure to do it well, do it right and keep our certification. The primary improvement efforts that we had had for this dysphagia compliance centered on re-educating the nurses to follow the five rights of medication administration. And there wasn't a whole lot of efforts beyond nurses to increase our compliance. So we initiated an interdisciplinary approach that would illuminate additional opportunities to increase that compliance while promoting a collaborative process. So, Dysphagia compliance um, being it's required to meet the standards for a comprehensive stroke center. Uh, it enhances our patient safety, decreases our length of stay, decreases cost. So the issues we were finding with our current practice was route documentation errors in the electronic health record. Medications um, were defaulting to the PO route in the MAR when the providers would order them. And the default order route, it wasn't noticed so the meds may even be given correctly, but documented incorrectly. And of course, when joint commission reviews, it's the documentation that they see, not the actual administration. So this shows our compliance um, in the early in early 2020 in January, and you can see our compliance had dipped as low as 60%. So that clearly is not where we wanted to be as an organization. So. As it happened, currently there were other independent projects happening at the same time. 
I was in the process of unifying multiple stroke related or swallow related policy policies um, by myself, trying to unify and um, clarify the language that was confusing in these different policies. There was also a SELT project at that time that was addressing a housewide increase in aspiration pneumonia. So at that time, only stroke patients needed to be screened for dysphagia on admission. But with the increase in the aspiration pneumonia rates, it was decided to expand that to all inpatients. Also at the same time, we were revamping the hospital swallow screen workflow that was supported by our speech and language pathology partners, myself and the Epic Optimization Coordinator role, which I'll talk briefly about shortly. So going by groups, my role um, in this as the clinical specialist, many people don't know about uh, the intricacies of the clinical nurse specialist role. There's actually five roles within being a CNS, expert clinician, leader, consultant, researcher, and educator. And then we operate along three spheres of impact, direct care, working with the patients and families, nursing practice, working directly with the nurses and also ensuring they're employing best practices, and then working on a systems or organizational level. So the actions that I took as part of this project, um, in, we did multidisciplinary interviews for their workflow improvement options. So this included unit leadership, providers, pharmacists, nurses, speech and language pathology, and the EPIC optimization coordinator. So we consulted with frontline nurses, we collaborated with the SLPs, and we aligned with the EOC. And I'll talk a little bit more about this shortly. So coming up to this project, um, I had a student that was going to be starting with me, a clinical nurse specialist master's student. And knowing that this student was going to need a project for her coursework, I reached out to my uh, patient care managers and my unit educators and said, what are the issues that are vexing our unit right now? So hoping to target that for my student's project. And hands down, everybody said dysphagia compliance is our Achilles heel right now, especially coming into the Joint Commission survey. This was really a high value target for us to focus on. And so we looked at um, unit targets for improvement and this perspective was what I took forward. Um, also knowing that a lot of times the approach is for many projects, if we just fix the nurses, then everything will be all right. And this doesn't really sit well with me as a career nurse that a lot of things are just put in the lap of the nurses and saying, this is the only thing that needs to be fixed. I thought there were a lot more seats at the table. So this shows the outreach that I wanted to do um, for this project, reaching out to the, um, the patient care manager, working with the unit educator. So our triad of consultation, reaching out to the providers themselves, pharmacy, working with EPIC partners, frontline nurses, and our speech and language pathologists. I really love this model, the Swiss cheese model, um, showing that when you align different aspects, any hole in the Swiss cheese can allow a problem to propagate and reach the patient. So how I envisioned this project with was with different um, provider levels and different disciplines having their own slice in the Swiss cheese. And again, when those holes line up, a problem can propagate and reach the patient. So this was my approach coming into this project. So key stakeholders that we identified that we wanted to speak to were the providers, pharmacy, EPIC, nurses, and speech and language pathologists. So when we did these interviews, these were some of the top issues that came about. Um, the providers wanted clarity around the SLP orders, the oral to feeding tube conversion. There was delays in the activation of that. Medication orders post conversion were defaulting to the oral route and there were communication gaps. Pharmacy's top issues also centered around the PO to feeding tube conversion order and also the communication delays. The EHR top issues were highlighting this PO to feeding tube conversion. It was basically buried in the MAR. And there was confusing terminology between the swallow screen, the swallow test, and the swallow evaluation. And then the alignment with the multiple swallow policies. And I have to apologize, I see there's chats coming up and I'm not able to read them when I'm in presenter mode. So um, if somebody's able to monitor the chat for me, that would be very helpful. Thank you. 
Uh, the top issues from the frontline nurses included, again, the PO defaulted meds weren't being recognized as the incorrect route, and the administration routes were not well highlighted in the MAR, and the MAR med route didn't always match the SLP recommendations. For the speech and language pathologist, the SLP notes in the EHR were auto-populating to the current time that they wrote the note rather than when they actually did the evaluation or treatment. Also, the options were limited on the, R, the EHR feeding and medication route. This is an interesting thing. As we looked at all of these issues, this is basically a list of everything I just discussed broken out by discipline. But what we've done here is highlighted in yellow everything that had to do with the EHR. So as you see, there were a lot of um, overlapping things and a lot of issues that by looking into EPIC, hopefully we could target those and kind of, you know, one stone, get a lot of birds. So some of the collaborations and interventions that happen. So this is where the multidisciplinary comes in. I'm actually the co-chair of our Stroke Quality and Education Committee. So working there with our frontline nurses to identify practice differences, we got recommendations from multiple disciplines on how to improve. And we incorporated those recommendations into the unified policies and workflows that I was working on. Also working on the policy and procedure committee, this is where the unified policy went for vetting with our frontline nurses and other stakeholders for approval and editing before moving into the throughput process. We also had a unit educator work group that our unit educator led and I supported. This assisted with three units, our L4, L5, and L6, all of our neuroscience units coming together to solve the problem rather than each unit working independently and coming up with three different solutions. And on this work group, it itself was a multidisciplinary work group with providers and frontline nurses and SLP involved. And I was acting in a supportive role to this group. Also incorporating the uh, CELT outcomes of the broadening the SLP swallow screens to all patients. And then one of the beneficial partnerships here was working with our EOC, our Epic, Epic Optimization Coordinator, um, who had a different role that I will talk about in just a minute. So as many of you know, this is the A3 template that we use for project improvement. And the unit educator used this template in working with um, her group. She led the unifying group of the unit educators um, to look at a fishbone, and then they had weekly meetings and came up with frontline nurse approaches to improve their workflow. So interventions here, um, they talked about the screening and huddles, they educated on the policy with the staff, and they increased the pharmacy awareness of the incorrectly ordered the med routes, and then they added the med route to review in the RN to RN shift handoff. With our speech and language pathology partners, they had um, shifting involvement to help reduce their dysphagia opportunities for improvement. The, um, really, their big areas are their 24-hour time to initial concept, consult benchmarks and proper administration of their three-ounce water test and then appropriate exclusions. In analyzing their workflow, the SLP that we worked with found that most of the SLPs had no idea how their workflow was impacting nursing. Uh, for them, they were prioritizing the consults over point of care documentation, and they weren't aligning with when they were clearing patients, having the conversations with the nurses. Nurses were administering medications based on the SLP recommendations. Then the, the SLPs would sit down in the afternoon and write out all their notes. And so those notes were being timed at the time of writing, not at the time of intervention. And that in itself was causing really big problems, just the timing of everything. Because again, Joint Commission doesn't look at the actual practice, they look at the documentation. So the changes that the SLPs instituted was they established a workflow for including the med administration during their evaluation. Um, they had the option to recommend essential meds for otherwise NPO patients. And then they increased their awareness around the documentation errors. So they removed the auto population feature of the time on their notes. And they um, that helped to align their practice with the actual timing when things happened. Also collaboration changes. They now were part of our stroke intervention or interdisciplinary task force meetings. So now, SLPs had a seat in with the providers, with the frontline nurses, with other practitioners in our SIT meetings. 
And then they were also participating in the monthly review of our dysphagia OFIs. And they also included the nurse, dietitian, pharmacist, in addition to the providers when communicating any changes that they were going to make. So their, in, their communication went out much more broadly than it had been before. And I think this process really highlighted to the SLPs how integrated their practice was, even though their documentation had been very siloed. So it really brought them into the interdisciplinary fold, working with the rest of the team. Our EPIC optimization coordinator, this was such a pivotal role, and I've not seen this anywhere other than Stanford. And I just think this is such a great, great role. Um, we developed clinical nurses that were temporarily assigned to work with the EPIC team as liaisons with their frontline nursing experience. They conducted research to become subject matter experts and they led focused work groups on their optimization projects. The EOC that we were assigned actually was one of our neuroscience nurses. So he was perfectly positioned to be effective in this role. So he participated in workflow studies to inform their decisions he facilitated the work groups of pertinent stakeholders and advisors and provided real-time support for the nurses when we were launching the new EPIC enhancements. So what our EOC did, um, he assessed the EPIC change requests that were related to the medication routes, just, the, just those safes that related to meds. So he also assembled stakeholders separately from all the other groups to analyze the med admin challenges. So I was a part of that group. Then it, it also included the SALT changes surrounding the SWALU evaluation, our unit educators, and then our SLP. He conducted a root cause analysis and surveys, and he helped design the EPIC storyboard um, that is now in EPIC that I'll show you in just a, in a bit. This is one of the process maps that he did, and I think this is so essential, looking at the swim lanes. And again, he also looked through that multidisciplinary lens about who else is sitting at this table, what is the workflow, and where are their opportunities? All these stars are basically, oops, sorry about that. All the stars that you see are potential areas where discrepancies could happen. So looking at the frontline nurses, the SLP workflow, the provider workflow, and pharmacy workflow. So as you can see, there were many opportunities where discrepancies can crop up. He also surveyed the nurses. He surveyed 50 nurses and found that there was a high majority of time where there was more than 10 minutes spent in a shift just dealing with medication route issues. Nothing else, just med route issues. So clearly a big problem with our frontline nurses, and this was really looked into by our EOC. So the interventions that our EOC did was developing this new swallow safety storyboard that I mentioned. What this did was it aligned the EHR display with the unified swallow safety procedure. So the EOC and I worked very, very closely as I was unifying the policies, I knew he was developing the storyboard and we worked very closely with our speech and language pathologists, especially the three of us, to say if we're creating these policies and unifying them and you're creating the storyboard, we better make sure that they dovetail from the get-go. So we unified those from during the process rather than waiting, you know, working independently and afterwards say, oh gosh, my policy doesn't support your storyboard or the storyboard doesn't support the policy. We thought let's work together and get it locked and loaded from the get-go so that once they're both released, they're already in tandem and support each other. So we aligned the EHR display with the unified swallow safety procedure. We even named them very similarly so that visually they would be aligned as well. And we also had greater visibility of the oral to feeding tube conversion order moved to the top of the MAR so it was visible to the pharmacy and the nurses. So this was the tool that the um, EOC developed. You can see down here, there's the swallow safety tool button where you can hover to discover. This provides transparency among multiple disciplines. So the frontline nurses, the SLP providers, pharmacy, because as you, some of you know, when you log into Epic, a lot of it is siloed by your, by your discipline as to what you're able to see. So with this swallow safety tool, multiple disciplines can hover to discover and see the pop-up window, no matter what their um, specialty is. So this is what pops up when you do the hover to discover, this is what pops up. And again, all disciplines are able to see this now. So we have the nursing swallow screen, 
the SLP evaluation, the nutrition orders, the SLP notes. So everybody's able to look and see what is the diet order? When was the last swallow eval done? Let me link in and you can click these links and see the SLP notes. What is the current diet? So it really is a wonderful one-stop shopping that really brings in that multidisciplinary aspect. And I really have to give it up to our EOC in developing this and then aligning it with the policies. I think this is just such a great effective tool that he developed. So some of the improvements and outcomes that we saw from this was the unification of the A3s from the three, un the three neuro units. Instead of working independently and in silos, this unification made for a much stronger unification and project and much greater effectiveness in their approach. This improved the RN handoff that now includes the discussion of the swallow route in the meds. The charge nurse handoff has been updated to include the swallow eval status in their current diet. SLPs joined the OFI review process. The SLP workflow was adjusted to reduce the timing and the documentation and the communication related errors. I had the unification of the swallow policies. We highlighted the PO to feeding tube conversion up to the top of the MAR. The swallow safety board was created and this all enhanced our patient safety. So some of those solutions that we had was increased communication there was a lot clearer medication and food route options, and this supported the providers, the SLPs, and the nurses. There was greater adherence to the individually ordered meds after that PO to feeding tube conversion is in place. The providers were now checking the route before prescribing the medication because they weren't aware that the default went to PO, even if the patient had a feeding tube. The pharmacy was now checking the conversion before validating the medication, and the nurses following the five rights were the last line to ensure that the medication was going in the proper route. The EHR enhancements that were stimulated by this group, the sign and held orders for the PO to feeding tube conversion, the highlighting of that conversion order again to the top of the MAR, removing the default time on the SLP's notes, all of these were huge enhancements to EPIC. So as you can see our compliance, this is just a, I drew out the timing. So here's that initial 60% low that we saw. So you can see these are when the, um, in the various activities were implemented. So A is when the unit educator unification was started. B is when um, my project with my student was initiated. Then at C was when the SLP practice was adjusted. D is when the swallow procedures were unified. And then E is when the Swallow Safety Storyboard went live. So you can see as these were initiated, our compliance really came into, um, into a higher level of compliance where we wanted to see it. So had a dramatic impact. So our survey outcomes, we had a successful Joint Commission survey with a redesignation as a comprehensive stroke center. And we received the American Heart Association Get With The Guidelines Gold Plus Achievement Award. Um, so in conclusion, we found that multidisciplinary collaborations created a powerful and beneficial partnership. We had clearly defined and aligned procedures that enhanced uh, consistent practice. We enlisted the interdisciplinary team so that multiple issues were resolved during the process rather than after the conclusion and having to go back and fix things. And also the procedure clarity combined with the multidisciplinary enhancements will benefit patient safety and outcomes. And these are our references. And if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer them. And then I also wanted to give a shout out to, these are my main collaborators in addition to our stroke program partners. Um, this was Noah, our EOC. He's a clinical nurse four on L5. Madison Fox is our clinical specialist for our speech and language pathologist with a focus in neuroscience. And then Corinne Petroshonis is a clinical nurse four and the unit educator on L6. So thank you so much. And I'm happy to answer questions. Thank, thank you, Stacy. Um, for anybody who has uh, questions, please enter them in the chat. Um, Stacey, I have a question for you. Yep. And first, let me qualify by saying, I'm sorry if that went super quick. I was asked to do this in about 30 minutes, and I think I made it just on the nose. No, you did. We did wonderful. <laughs> Thank you. Um, what, would, what would you say when you are starting the project 
what was one of the uh, more difficult things that you maybe didn't anticipate when you're working with an inter interdisciplinary group, trying to pull everybody together, the stakeholders? Part of the problem we had at the beginning was the constraints of my students' semester. Um, we had wanted to interview nutritionists for this. So in future projects, we would also add nutrition into this. But that was one of the constraints was trying to get all of the provider interviews in within the time frame of her semester and when she had to wrap up the project. And I think um, one of the other barriers for me in helping to lead this project was just the kind of the lack of awareness of many of the di disciplines and how their practice affected the other disciplines because we were so siloed in how we how we practiced that a lot of the disciplines didn't really consider other disciplines in their workflow and how the dominoes would affect. Thank you. Um, a question for you is, was there any opportunity to include patients and family in this collaborative work to hear their feedback? That wasn't really uh, one of the foci of this particular project, but that would definitely help. Um, I think that would just add one more layer. In, in this particular project, our main focus was just coming into compliance in advance of our Joint Commission survey. But certainly moving forward, I would be happy to see the horizons broadened to include patients and families and see um, their perspective in this as well. Thank you. Um, another question similar to mine, and when putting together such a large multidisciplinary group, one of the challenges is identifying who the right people are to include as stakeholders. Anything that surprised you or any challenges that you ran into getting the group together? Well, coming with my research hat on, I can say that the interviews were very much um, a convenient sample of interviewees. Um, we basically took whoever we could get in representatives. Um, we thought we wanted to have a multidisciplinary um, perspective, but then you think, okay, who from pharmacy has openings in their calendar and is willing to talk to us? And so because this was a neuro focus, we targeted our neuro partners first. So the pharmacy, the pharmacy partners that work with our neuro peeps and the SLP that we worked with had a neuro focus. And so that's where we started were those discipline partners that worked with our neuro patients. And then it was, again, the constraints of my students' semester and who had openings in their calendar and time to be able to sit with us to have these conversations and look at their workflows. Thank you. Um, and another question for you. It definitely shows that communication and documentation were key elements to approve the screening process. With extremely lofty AHA goals of 100% screening, what are the remaining areas that you are still uh, seeing that need to be addressed? One of the things that we're seeing is maintenance. Uh, as many people in education know, anytime you're educating to a procedure or a workflow change, those results only last for about three to six months with an education intervention. And so to maintain our compliance, we're still looking to what are those things that we can employ beyond education to maintain that compliance? Um, because, okay, in all honesty, after the graph, um, this was the graph that I used for some of the other presentations. So of course you want it to look really, really good. Um, and after the end of this graph, I have to be honest, our, our compliance did dip a little bit, but then we've come back up. But we saw that dip and we think, okay, how can we you know, manage these little dips? Because as the education falls off, what do you do to maintain that compliance? And that's sort of the, con the conundrum where we are now is what are those interventions that can create that long-term compliance? And so that's where we are about now. Thank you. Um, that's all the questions in the chat. Are there any other questions for Dr. Serber? Great presentation, um, Stacy, and very interesting process. And I see how it lines with other multidisciplinary care processes. Um, 
thinking back to as you started this process, what did the barriers uh, identified by your different stakeholders align? Um, or were there different barriers for nurses versus speech language pathology versus pharmacy? It was a little of both. Um, we looked at a lot of the different barriers. Basically what we did with each of the interviews we had, we asked two questions. We said, what is your workflow around dysphagia and what are your barriers to success? And we just kind of let the conversation flow from there and just took notes on what they saw were the barriers. And that's what became the slides in the front of the um, presentation about how we um, basically looked at barriers by discipline. And as we looked at that, there were some common themes that came up and that's where the communication and the documentation and the EHR issues kind of popped up. There were some discipline specific things, um, as I mentioned with the SLPs, having the time difference between when they did their actual screening. So what their workflow basically was, was they would screen the patients, they would come out and tell the nurse, okay, you can go ahead and give them meds or give them a diet or whatever. And then they would go on about their day and screen more patients where the nurse would go in and start giving medications. Then when the SLP would sit down in the afternoon and start their charting, the note auto-populated. And so they didn't change the time. So when the Joint Commission surveyor looks at this, they say this patient wasn't cleared till four in the afternoon, but they were given meds at nine in the morning. And that created a fallout. And nursing was just going about their business. SLPs were just going about their business without any idea that this workflow was creating those fallouts. And so just highlighting that was huge. And so it was kind of both that there were issues that were discipline specific, but then also things that affected each other and overlapped a bit. And another question, um, it's first time I've heard about the EOC position. Um, and I guess, where is that group based? And like, when can they help with these efforts? And how do you get into contact with them? <laughs> well, first, before I hand it off, um, I have to say, this role was absolutely pivotal. Um, our EOC, Noah, as I mentioned, was one of our L5 nurses. So perfectly positioned with his neuro experience to understand the neurospecific workflow and be positioned to liaison with the EPIC team and with the SALT team and with me, with our unit educator. So he was perfectly positioned. And in terms of the EOC, if I can put you on the spot, Jerry, um, are, you, are you able to speak to your EOC? Because Jerry is one of the people that helps run the EOC program. Sure. Um, yeah. So I'm Jerry Wessel. I'm an informatics nurse specialist and one of the managers for nursing informatics. Our EOC program are our bedside staff that come with us kind of on contract for up to six months. Uh, we're starting a new cohort that will start in May. And so it's typically once a year that we'll bring them on. Um, and we just kind of mentor and guide them in informatics and what that looks like as bedside staff, but they apply their bedside knowledge and use our informatics principles and get involved in our Epic tickets and process and group network. Thank you, Jerry. Um, and Dr. Serber, there is another question too. Um, it's about your plans to spread this work. Uh, it says we in quality still see a lot of aspiration and pneumonia that contributes to post-op sepsis. And I'm they're wondering if other units will follow the same policy and are aware of all the improvements you made for stroke. I'm not sure of the awareness, but the policy, um, the unified swallow safety policy now is live and has been for a bit in policy tech. So it is now the policy of the entire adult side of the hospital. Um, so that policy has been in place for a bit. Um, in terms of spreading the work, as I mentioned, uh, we were accepted for uh, publication pending minor revisions for the Journal of Neuroscience Nursing. So there is plans to disseminate um, in a publication. But as far as more locally, housewide, that policy is available in policy tech. And so now the swallow screening is expanded to all patients, not just stroke patients. So the policy would apply housewide instead of just to stroke patients. 
Any other questions? Well, I want to thank you, Dr. Serber, for your time today. Um, wonderful presentation. And if there are any other questions that you may have, please feel free to email Selena or myself or Sam, and we are more than happy to follow up with Dr. Serber to answer your question. Let me also say, again, such a great honor to present to this esteemed group. I appreciate the invitation and just such a great opportunity to present our great work. And I'm so proud of the work that our team did and the results that we got. And I'm just delighted to be able to share it with you today. Thank you. Thank you, Stacey. And Selena has...